Hello, everybody. My name is Guillaume Joachim. Um, I had the opportunity to meet our lecturer uh, in Liège a year ago during the Real Estate Architecture Summer School. Uh, at the time, I introduced the lecture he gave together with Matteo Costenzo from 2A plus PA. And tonight, I'm delighted to introduce again a conference of FALA in Belgium. In Portuguese, FALA means simultaneously informal speech and the ability to speak, the state of not being mute. Fala Atelier has indeed a lot to say about architecture, yet the production of the office is still hard to define and too young to label. It's a small and young office. Well, it was a small and young office. The team is working in the same 25 square meter room in Oporto, around the same table. Felipe Magalaes is 30 years old and is the oldest member of the team. Despite, despite its use, the practice has created more than 80 projects since 2013, including many competitions, private projects, a few installations, exhibition, and folly. The atelier's work has also been exhibited in several architecture biennales, including the ones in Lisbon, Venice, and lately Chicago, which is still ongoing. FALA has been presented in lecture around the globe, and in addition to the office production, FALA has been teaching art architecture theory seminars uh, at Bratislava's Faculty of Architecture and participated last year uh, at the first real estate architecture summer school in Liège. Last but not least, uh, in the pedigree, FALA's Facebook page has more than 20,000 followers. FALA Atelier is rooted in the various professional, academic, and curatorial experiences of its leaders, Felipe Magalaes, Ana Luisa Soares and Ahmed Belkoja. Felipe and Ana Luisa both studied architecture in Porto before going to the Faculty of Architecture in Ljubljana and Tokyo University, respectively. Ahmed was born in Lausanne, studied at ETH Zurich, uh, as well as Lausanne, Gothenburg, and Singapore. All three started working for Ari Guger in Basel, then Felipe and Ana Luisa went working in Japan respectively for Sanaa and Toyo Ito, while Ahmed moved to New York and practiced with Obra Architects before joining Atelier Bauer in Tokyo. The Atelier was born in 2013 in Tokyo's Nagaking Capsule Tower and settled in the city of Oporto. The three designers decided to open an office uh, in Portugal at 25 years old, uh, when, at, when at the time an architectural brain drain was occurring and gentrification process uh, in Oporto and Lisbon led to huge private investments in housing projects in the old city centers. Facing the difficulty to start an office and make it stable, especially in Portugal, Fala developed the vision by acting in two different and apparently opposite playgrounds related to intimate space and utopian visions. On the one hand, they fought to defend their ideas in very utopian competition proposals and competition they agreed at start to lose on purpose. And on the other end, they started to collaborate with foreign real estate promoters on very pragmatic and small budget renovations that they called them themselves built compromises. Like Philippe said last year in Liège, we like to believe that these two opposites tend to contaminate each other's. The pragmatism that the cheap renovation forces us to have has an impact on the utopia that the competitions present. And at the same time, this utopia allows us to look at these renovations on a more broad, broader sense than a simple cheap transformation. The excuse of being young and unexperimented drove them to take what they call naive risks in order to turn, to turn this ar architectural commission into interesting opportunities for them. Again, I'll quote Felipe who said, we are young architects, so to some extent, being naive is a condition, not an option. We produce a naive architecture because we believe clients care, and they don't. We always think that trying something is more important than doing things correctly. Fala considered the conditions of their first small project, uh, the ones with little resources of time and budget, as limitations, but at the same time as challenges. They managed to transform fragmented spatial arrangement into clear spaces 
composed of white and abstract canvas contrasting with minimalist touches of color, texture, and patterns. The economy of means to build and represent their projects contributes to develop their own domestic as well as utopian realms. Fala's trademark is also their particular way of talking about architecture through a precise and radical combination of re representational means. Each project is presented through a dialectic between clear and, clear and clean plans and vibrant and detailed speculative illustrations. Opposing the, the, architectural, the architecture's rationality to impressionist impre expressions of a world dense in references. Using the same graphic material, the same layout and the same drawing techniques to communicate, Fala invites us to a complete immersion in the obsessive universe and makes visible a common ground of the design process based on quoting, stealing and combining references in a beautiful and a little innocent way. Unlike many other young practice, they assume their guilty pleasures, their obsessions, their fascinations and their heroes by trying to search honestly for the references that inspire them, the origins of the topics and the persistency of themes that attract them. For Fala Atelier, architecture is thus a serious exercise demonstrating a passion for architectural theory but approach with honesty, naivety, and a bit of provocation. Their projects arise both from a combination of unpredictable references and from their quest for a clear architectural language. Now, after more or less four years of experimentations, the atelier is facing a crossroads. The commissions are moving from small-scale renovations to new building designed from scratch, and several construction sites are ongoing. As a matter of consequence, Fala started a self-centered research on their production, now edited in their book, Fala Zero One. But now tonight's lecture is on your hands, Felipe. So, uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, Bozard, uh, Roxane, Guillaume, everyone that was part of the process of having us here, <coughs> of having us here tonight. Uh, it's, it's a true pleasure to have the chance to present our office's work in Brussels, uh, mostly in a moment where Belgium is assuming its position as the, the core of European architecture um, in contemporary times. And honestly, I'm always looking forward for a good excuse for some moule frites. I don't really understand the concept. It's quite weird, but I love it. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, and I would like to start by illustrating more or less what Guillaume was trying to talk about. What is our office? What actually is Fala on a physical sense? Fala is mostly this, one table, eight, nine chairs, depending on the day of the week, a lot of laptops, chaos, disorganization, a kind of unplanned beauty uh, that ends up taking the form of buildings, installations, competition proposals, texts, lectures. Um, but like everything in our office, it was never really, really planned. It was, it happened almost by chance when we decided to buy a space to start a an office, too soon I would say, we were too young. Uh, but at the same time, if that push wouldn't happen, we would probably not be here today. So sometimes a leap of faith is not a bad thing. And it's beautiful to work around this table, not for practical reasons, as you can imagine, it's terrible. You cannot have a proper meeting, you cannot talk about budgets, you cannot, I mean, you cannot build a model. We build models when Ahmed goes to Switzerland, because then a spot opens and we have space to actually cut cardboard. But there's, there's something more important than that, and I truly believe that the architecture we produce is deeply related to this uh, one and a half by three meters table where we all work. Um, I would like to start by giving a short timeline of where we are, or where we have been, where we are, and where we plan to be in the future, because for the first time in our history, 
if we can call it history, uh, we are thinking ahead. We are trying to understand what is, what is, what is the next step, what is, what is happening in a few months. Uh, as Guillaume again said, I'm gonna say this a lot tonight, you said a lot of things. Uh, we started with competitions, uh, utopian competitions, competitions that we knew since day one there was no chance we were gonna win, but we didn't care. And that's something that happens very often. Many times we don't care. And at some point, the addition of more and more competitions led us to a couple of curatorial projects. Uh, this one on the research of our time at Uh the, the continuous media exposure in, a, in the market in which we were operating gave us the chance to renovate small fragments of old historic buildings that, you know, I'm not gonna say I don't like them because they, uh, a good project doesn't have a scale, but they were very limited in their ambition. You could do very little. The perimeter was defined. You could just somehow intervene partially on it. As this kept piling up, we got the opportunity to actually do a few more interesting ones, like how to transform uh, a huge garage into a beautiful loft in the city center of Lisbon. We started working with private uh, companies for a couple of commercial projects. Uh, we were faced with our first public expression, our first facade. Uh, and now we are at the stage where we are mostly designing single family houses. This is the first one. I'm gonna talk about it later and bigger buildings, bigger commissions, uh, mostly, not mostly, exclusively related to a private sector. So we are always working with Excel sheets, areas, budgets, price per square meter. This is, this is very common and you will notice tonight I will talk about that a lot. Um, the renovations that were the size of one apartment are now taking the size of entire buildings. Um, this building alone is bigger than everything else we built until this moment. Um, and at the same time, the, the possibility of actually building city is intriguing us more and more and more. So when we were refurbishing, when we were transforming, when we were adjusting and the existing structures, we were somehow correcting a trajectory that was not going where we wanted. And the maximum we can do is to kind of curve it in your way. But when you build something from scratch, you define the, the trajectory as a start. So you can, you can really express the kind of architecture you want to produce, the kind of intentions you want to you wanna express. And this is one of the funniest buildings we have under construction now. Um, but ambition doesn't have scale. And to be completely honest, the first house we built was this one. And the fact that the client was a bird doesn't make it less of a house. Uh, he had needs, he had a clear program, and a clear budget also. So the final result of a birdhouse is not less architecture for us than a museum or a school. At the same time, we are also teachers. Uh, our teaching experiences are starting to also add up. and. It's quite fascinating, I must say. Some of our students are older than us, which is quite quite curious. And we are having the chance to divide these teaching experiences in two main realms. One that I would call research, where when we have long periods of teaching in the same context, uh, we mostly analyze and depict. We don't create anything with the students. We mostly try to understand certain architectural conditions and certain architecture themes that truly fascinate us, like masterpieces that have the size of houses but that are not actually houses. Uh, and in short term teaching experiences, we are more focused on the playground of creation, on how to do architecture, how to very shortly and intensely produce space, produce an architectural discourse, produce provocations. These two realms have resulted in different curatorial projects. This is the project, this is a photo of a model of the models we just exhibited in the Chicago Biennial where 
our own research on the Japanese houses built between 69 and 74 resulted on this, uh, on this installation. And this is something we keep doing inside the office. So we are not already close to the outside world. We keep actually adding more and more to what interests us and what interests us and attracts us. And at the same time, once in a while, we are also asked to, in very specific exhibitions, to produce art, which is very, very strange, asking architects to produce art per se. But uh, once in a while it happens and it's quite, quite, a position, quite a discomfortable position to be in. It's not an uncomfortable position to be in. It's not, a, it's not something we are truly familiar with, but we end up learning a thing or two about it. And this is the most important project we have in the office right now. It's not the most important because it's the biggest or the one that is paying the most. Actually, it's not paying anything. It's the most important because it's our new office. It's actually the first time we are designing for ourselves. It's the first time we are, as I said, planning ahead. And it's the first time we have the chance to face ourselves with our own fears and ambitions and uh, our complexities, let's say. Um, and the project is already under construction, although I'm not gonna show any photos. But it's, we call it House and Atelier because it has three doors, as you can see. The blue doors lead you to domestic spaces, so my apartment and Anna's. Uh, we are partners in the office, but we are also partners, uh, well, in life. Um, and the second door leads you to Ahmed's apartment. And then the pink door that suggests public use leads you to the office that takes the full basement and uh, because this is a build, this is a very complex and intricate building. You see, like there's an axis of symmetry on one half, and then there's this very weird space on piece of facade, and on the back facade, and ah, and this is a renovation, as you see. There's there's an existing structure that we are keeping, but this building somehow summarizes what is our current condition because it's true that it is partially renovation but half of it was built from scratch so there's a certain ir irony on it that it's happening at this moment where we are transiting from the first stage to the second and on the back facade a completely new facade you can see the didactic side of the program where the housing stands on top of a glass facade that is the office uh, but more important than that I would like just to show the two together one is new, the other one is half new. The one is designed by an architect that we don't know the name 60 years ago. The other one is designed by the three of us. But in the end, the two of them make so much sense together. They, they, they just tag along quite well, I think. And if everything goes okay, everyone is invited. Next year in June, we're gonna have a big party for the opening. Just bring the beers and and this leads us to the key question, or the two key questions, who we are, or who are we, and what we want. And I can tell you that we are a young Portuguese practice. We are operating in a post-crisis economy. We are faced daily with extremely low budgets, uneducated clients, and most of the times repetitive programs. Experience is definitely not our backbone. It's not our main strength, quite the opposite. But despite all of these limitations, um, we are as naive as we are ambitious. We are full of energy. We are really passionate about producing architecture. We really, really enjoy what we do. That's why we do it every day, Mondays, Saturdays, Sundays, holidays, it doesn't matter. And we are extremely curious to find out what lies ahead for us. So there's this moment in which we are now, and we are really, really trying for the first time to plan it, but it's going to fail. But we are curious to find out what really is going to happen in the upcoming years. At the same time, we need to understand what we want, and the planning part lies a little bit on that. And I, can, I know that at this stage we are expanding, we are growing, the office is getting bigger and bigger projects, it's getting more and more complex commissions. We, we have now an agenda. The projects, they are not isolated anymore. We don't do a project without actually looking at the other projects and try to put it in a, let's call it a mental map where everything comes together. 
and our architecture is not really, I mean, we don't have a body of work that allows Kenneth Frampton to write something about it, but our architecture in our own perspective is not an architecture of detail, is not a one to two scale or one to five scale architecture, it's more an architecture of space. And tonight I'm gonna to talk a lot about it. Our architecture is an architecture where most of the results don't come of sketching or of model making or 3D rendering. They come mostly from long talks, long discussions between everyone around one table. And our architecture comes out of a method. The study where we come from, me and Anna, has a very strong connotation to the expression method. And I really believe that that's something we, we gained from our time there. And more important than all of this is that our architecture is both logical while intuitive, but we are optimist about our relationship with the discipline. So we are not afraid of committing mistakes, of assuming our guilty pleasures, etc., etc. We are obsessed with a few themes, consistency, format, the way spaces are used and occupied. You will see that in the images we propose, this is actually 50% of the project, almost exposing someone inside, how that person is actually occupying the space. And we don't really want to be labeled, but we would be fine with postmodern. About one year ago, after a summer school in Liège, uh, when I came back to Porto, we were discussing the results of the workshop where with an amazing team of eight students from different countries, we depicted several architectural proposals in plans and collages. And at that time, we were intrigued by the simplicity of those means. Like, it is, this was something we did before. It was not a first time in Liège, but all the plans were from different buildings and they were drawn at the same scale with the same graphic style. So it allowed us to do a fair comparison between all of them. It allowed us to somehow study them as a group and not just as individuals. And we decided to do exactly the same thing in the office's production. So we took away all the competitions, we took away all the utopia, let's say, and we focused on all the projects that we had either built or had under construction, and we decided to study them side by side. So we redrew all the plans, we found uh, our own, let's say, graphical language that could fit all of them, we put them side by side, organized them chronologically, and we started to understand that after the first curve came the second, came the third, came the fourth, came the fifth, sixth, seven. After the first central column that somehow creates a hierarchy in the space, came the second, the third, the fourth. And we started understanding that there was actually a vocabulary going on. Uh, that was a vocabulary that was being somehow created. And that intrigued us a lot because we, we didn't plan it. It was just happening naturally. So we started to look at the wall and to always have these plans there. So every new project that showed up after that point became somehow a project in comparison, in relation. So we cannot have another project below without looking at everything that is behind and understand it. And at the same time, we did the same thing with all the collages we had at that point. So we just put them sequentially, we organized them by program, so cultural, houses, apartments, buildings, etc. And we started to understand that even if we never thought about it, the way how we do collages for houses is radically different from the way how we do collages for apartments. The way how we do collages for housing blocks is radically different from the way how we do collages for a single uh, apartment, for example, which, is, which was never really planned at all, but it just showed that there was some sort of background uh, logic to them that we were not even considering at the time. And at this stage, we understood that with these two tools, we could uh, describe all our architecture. Because plans are dry, plans are like a text. You know, you can put a plan in China and people can read it. You can measure it. I can actually write a text, give it to someone else, and that person can draw exactly the plan I wrote about. Collages are the absolute opposite. You cannot describe them. You react to them. You like them, you hate them, you love them. Well, that's up to you. But the collage has a, a strength, a kind of punch, that when side by side with a plan, 
tells you the whole story about a certain architectural idea. It might not say everything about the project. You still need sections, models, you know, a lot more to do the complete architecture piece. But the architectural idea, that's, that's completely, completely clear with these two. And we decided to print 10 books to give to each of our collaborators, but then it was too expensive, so we decided to print 1,000 instead. And then we would sell a few, and this was the result. And the, the result was not really about the project. So this was our first publication, let's say, our first book. So what we decided to do was, instead of doing project A, B, C, D, we focus exclusively on the tools. So you have all the plans of these 32 projects and then all the images of these 32 projects. And most of the times the images are produced in duets and well, there's a lot more to it, but I will talk about it in the projects that I will show after. Choosing a title for a lecture is extremely complicated. So I brought three. Um, and I think these three are three from seven or eight or ten, I don't know, that I had on a, on a notebook. And I think they somehow, all of them could be a very good fit for today's talk. But uh, I also thought it was unfair to the other two if I would just choose one. Um, and what I'm going to do today is that I'm going to show you a few projects and they will always be shown in pairs or groups. The presentations are not going to be very deep in each project. We're not going to go, I'm not going to go in detail into them, but they are going to try to make sense as a pair. Uh, so you can, I mean, you can understand the pairs. And each one of these pairs is going to be focusing on one main theme. And that's what really matters. So in reality, although I'm going to show, I don't know, 12 projects, I think, I'm going to talk about six themes. The first one is nostalgia or in our case, the absolute lack of nostalgia that runs in the office. Uh, and the first project I'm going to show is a project that had very little to be nostalgic about. A young couple in Lisbon decided to buy a space to live in, an apartment, but the crisis led to a boom in the Portuguese market right now where the prices are going skyrocket high. So they couldn't find an apartment, so they instead bought a garage and they asked us to transform it into a housing unit. The garage was quite banal, so you can imagine there was a building here, so the car would cross the space and then park here. It had many uses during the years. There was a printing company there, there was a garage again, there was a small factory of pottery, uh, and the space had just one key quality that was, there were beautiful skylights, these gigantic skylights in the back that we decided to take advantage of. There was not a single window, not a single view. It's not a very easy project to start from, but it intrigued us a lot because we have been working on 18th century buildings for like two years at this stage. So this was something radically different that attracted us. And the first project, of course, I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about the process and how many options we did, the tools we used where the plan, the plan always comes first. Until we have a plan that we wanna work with, we don't actually move forward with 3Ds models or collages. But after these plans are tested, they somehow become collages. And the collages are very precise in their intentions, but very unprecise in, their, uh, in the way how the space is actually proportioned. So 3Ds are also common in the office. We don't deny that. And then since a very early stage, we show a clear interest in color, texture, uh, materiality. So these kind of images, they don't show up on construction site with the clients on the last minute. No, they actually show up even before we know what we're going to do. Um, and the project is actually very simple. We didn't change anything. I mean, in most of the buildings we are operating in, in this 18th century, 19th century uh, housing buildings, we actually try to say change as much as possible because the architecture we find there annoys us. But in this case, we had the least planned space ever, and with just a single gesture, we could fit the enclosed programs, and the house was done. The house worked as such. And the couple is a very young couple, they don't have any kids, they said they wanted to live alone, so with 200 euros per square meter, this is the maximum you could build also, so there was also that limitation. But we felt that this structural element and these skylights were everything we needed to actually do the project. The curtains brought color, the kitchen gives this fake glimpse of luxury, the hood 
becomes this kind of alien shape that you know gives a lot of identity, but at the same time makes no sense. Most people don't know what that is when we show the photos. They always ask, what's that blue thing on the kitchen? And in the end, even the bathroom doors become this kind of floating objects, and the space became exactly what we imagined. So the, this relation between what we see as an architectural intention on a distorted image and what the space actually is in the end is what really, really, really attracts us. If the detail on that skylight is not perfect, well, we're gonna give our best, but it's not really, really, really what we care about. The spatial idea and the spatial intention, that's what truly moves us daily. And as you can imagine, the space was very, it was completely transformed. It's, uh, all the walls were duplicated, there was insulation, ventilation, so there's, it's a very technical project, but the space, that we saw on the first day, that identity, those beams, that strength of the structure from the 50s remains the same. And then color plays a key role. I would never have red cabinets in my house, but we told the clients, buy cabinets that are red, blue, yellow, try to act in this space as the space requests. And the space requested this more free use. And like the kitchen does move, we all know that, but it feels like it could. It feels like I could just take this piece and put it somewhere else, everything somehow, refers to an idea of flexibility and uh, progression during time. And it's very nice, the complicity between the different programs. So this column and this curtain, they negotiate the relations between each of the, uh, of the functions of the uses, but at the same time, it's just one space. So it's like if you have 50 plus 50 plus 50 plus 50, but in the end, you have more than 200. And it's a very big space, it's about 220 square meters. Um, and and it's, a, it's a garage house, so it made sense to, to have a car inside. Uh, of course, we didn't put their car, we found a beautiful car because these photos needed a better car. But um, it's so nice when, you know, in Portugal we used to say that the clients want to take the car to the bed if they could. They can, they literally can. They, they can open the door of the car and jump in the bed and vice versa. And this is my favorite photo of the whole project where you don't see anything, but you see exactly what we saw on the first day, these very strong structural elements, these hints of domesticity, this spatial divider, this piece of mirror that reflects a bed and a car. I mean, if you show this to one of your parents and they have no idea what you're showing them, they will be so confused. But at the same time, it somehow summarizes the whole project. This is the, the space and the key fixed elements. And this is by far the most humble facade we will ever design. We just kept the gate as it was, we refurbished it and that was it. So it's a very, very cute, cute facade. And as I said, I'm gonna present the projects in pairs. And one year after we finished that one, uh, ah, and when I show the pairs, the second project was always designed as a consequence, direct or indirect, of the first project. So one year later, we were asked by this guy in Pnefiel, which is a small city around Porto, to transform a factory into a housing block. Uh, the context is quite beautiful. It's very dispersed. It's, you know, it's a village-like scenario where you have a couple of houses here and there. And this was the factory. It's a terrible factory. It's, the guy was, the guy that built this 20 something years ago decided to build it as a house, he wanted the factory to look like a house because he thought that it would actually fit the context, it would be less uh, aggressive to the context. Uh, and this kind of Frankenstein happened, you know, like you have, this is actually a concrete slab and then they just build a fake roof on top to make it look like a house. The, when we got there on the first day, the balconies were built just to put the AC machines, like they don't really need balconies, but well, and we thought that this was such an ironic project that we decided to make the factory that looked like a house, a housing unit that looked like a factory. We thought that there was an opportunity there to, to play with this double meaning and to somehow bring the qualities that the houses needed because you see these windows, they were too small. Everything was too scarce. And 
actually propose something that could make much more sense. So make the factory that was never there a reality. And this is the facade on, on the opposite side. And of course, we, we have our own references, our own obsessions. Uh, we come from different backgrounds. I mean, as you can imagine, we come from Porto, so we put Caesar above everyone else. But we are obsessed with Shinohara. We are obsessed with Peter Markley. We are obsessed with Caruso and John recently. It's, uh, it's something we have been obsessed with. But before even we being obsessed with anything, Ahmed was obsessed with Aznago Vender, and he was the one bringing it on the table. And now it's becoming more and more a reference of ours. And this to talk about the facade and the mistakes and this kind of small glitches that make the facade so much more interesting. And when we started looking at the plan, we found this quite disturbing plan where the, the, the structural axis is somehow not properly located, it's not very efficient, and we understood that this came from the distribution of the machines. Depending on the size of the machines, they would need different spans. So the fact that they had a production line defined the structural alignment, I mean, this guy was not an architect, as you can imagine. He was the one building it. He was the one making all the decisions out of need, but he actually gave us a lot of clues, because when we studied this structure, we actually ended up finding a grid that I assure you the guy didn't think about that could somehow organize the whole program. So you could divide the space in two parts, a type three apartment, a type two, with a kind of mistake that breaks this rigidity. You could fit the bathrooms. This one is amazing. If you sit on a toilet, you have a beautiful view over the mountains. And then let occupation begin. But most important, we found out that this mistake, I mean, if we would build this building from scratch, we would never put that structural axis in that location. But in this case, it was actually helping us to find an outstanding composition of spaces, a very hierarchized and stable composition that would allow us to produce an outstanding uh, relation between them. Although it's very pornographic, the relation you have between the bedrooms and the living room is very direct. And when we got there, this was what we found. I mean, no machines anymore. And this is what, what we envisioned, you know, like we have 300 euros per square meter to do this project. I don't know if you are familiar with this, but it's, it's nothing. It's building behind, below poverty line. It's really not at all enough. Uh, but we found solutions that would somehow operate inside this budget, because that's the only thing we cannot change. We can do whatever we want, the client doesn't care, as long as we respect the budget and we give him the, mar the profit margin he expects. And we started uh, the demolitions, the new walls. I, I really love the distinction between these two photos where you see everything that is below, all the planning, all the hours in the office, just fixing plugs and cables, and the simplicity of the final result. Uh, and this is more or less how it is today. We just sometimes like to, with these photos, do quick collages in the office just to kind of tease and preview what is coming ahead. And I mean, we don't have a budget, so the, all the pavement is going to be this uh, self-leveling cement that reflects, I mean, it's, it's very, very cheap, but I think it kind of makes sense. And what is funny is that when you look at the axle of the space, you actually understand that this is what is structuring the whole thing. Like the mistake from 86 or 87 is actually the biggest asset the building has today. And on the outside, uh, it was very funny to see the different steps. It's a stone structure on the perimeter, so we needed to start from the top down. And today, this is more or less how it is. It's not finished yet. It's lacking all the handrails. It's lacking a few details, but it's quite close to what it will be in the end. And it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite fantastic because the people in the village think this is going to be a factory. They, they, they are always wondering, like there was a guy that told the construction company that they should not be putting the windows before they put the machines inside because they're going to break everything. And we are so happy that they saw it like that because if we would have planned that, we would have not achieved it, but they, they said so. And, and it's funny how, you know, these shitty architectural elements like grain pipes can become so crucial. Like, we could have disguised them, but by putting them on the worst location possible and moving this window on the other side and somehow creating a tension, I mean, 
these elements, if they are carefully placed, they will become important elements. So that's what we try to do here. And I think if we would remove them, these facades would be way, way worse. And now there's this debate on the proper finish between the flush white, the super harsh white. We are trying to find a materiality that we can pay for and that fits the, the architectural ambition we showed in the beginning. And the whole project is a system from the facade that of course reflects the plan, that somehow reflects the structural axis, that somehow, 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 somehow. So the project is not just a random finding, you know, you keep sketching until one day, aha, here it is. No, it's actually studied and talked and discussed a lot between us in the office. And when it finally happens, it has, it works as a whole. It doesn't work as a, a series of fragments put together to try to look nice. And this is the comparison. And, and what is funny is that in the end, these two projects, this was a consequence of this one. In this one, there was pretty much no intervention because we found a terrible space that was actually extremely beautiful. And in this one, there was a huge amount of intervention that is actually generated by a mistake, by a, a misinterpretation of how a structure should be calculated. And when you look at both of them, it's quite interesting to find out that this element, of course, is the center, it's the heart of the space. And in that case, we had to fight a lot with the client because he wanted to align that wall with this structure so that you wouldn't see those columns. But we managed to convince him, and these are going to be the bare elements in the middle of the living room that will somehow remind every user, even, you know, people live here and people live here, they don't know each other, but when they open their doors, there's, they're going to understand the connection that is going through their apartments or they will just paint it in another color and that's it. And this is what I was talking about. How, you know, these collages, they were not planned to be shown side by side, but how this element and how this element somehow brings so much identity. How ironically, the kitchen in both cases is a marble element. How ironically, all the movable elements follow the same kind of color scheme. And these were the conclusions we were reaching about one year ago. Overlaid systems. Let me check the time. Okay. So I was talking about 18th century buildings. Uh, here we go. This is, this is what we have most of the times in our tables. Uh, old owner finds out that on the newspaper someone is making a lot of money with refurbishments on the city center, so he also wants to refurbish the old property he has. Or, in some cases, reach for an investor, buys property to make even more money and become even richer than he already is. So this is the second case. Rich Lebanese investor bought an apartment in Chiado, a very nice area in Lisbon, and wanted to make uh, a type-free apartment. Uh, this was the plan. These four rooms had beautiful plastered ceilings, you know, these very ornamented uh, ceilings. And all of these interventions were done during the time between the beginning of the building and today. They were terrible, there were concrete slabs, I mean, it was very, very nasty. And what we proposed the client to do was to keep the rooms that were outstandingly beautiful and to repair the one that somehow was still repairable and to completely erase everything in the back. And with one single gesture, try to connect the entrance space to the kitchen, the dining, and the living. So by moving the bathrooms to a place where they were actually comfortable to use, we could somehow summarize the whole intervention. And this step happens just because we need to bring the pipes to the risers, but it helps in the end. And this is the, spa the spatial system. And why did I call it overlaid systems? Because, you know, you have two spatial structures going on right here. These four rooms, they follow a kind of classical composition of a room. They have a door, they have an axis, they have a certain symmetry. Every, actually, all of them are perfectly symmetrical in both their axes. And then you have this system that makes absolutely no sense. But these ones were designed 200 years ago. This one was designed three years ago. So. When you think about it, I think it would be lame, almost ridiculous, to try to act like we are, you know, restoring. We are not restorers. We are closer to inventors than restorers. We are transforming something, and transformation suggests change. So that's what we did. And what was funny is that in the end, because of these two elements, these two spaces are somehow divided. You know, this was the first time we had columns negotiating uh, 
the relation between two rooms, but at the same time they are connected. So you have three clearly defined spaces, but at the same time it's the same. So this is one of the classical rooms, you know, axis of symmetry, tall windows, plastered ceiling. And when you go to the living room, you see, it remains the same. It's exactly the same, symmetrical, classical, blah, blah, blah. But when you turn around, you have a dilemma because you could just add two more doors here and enclose it, or you could just uh, accept that these elements would be enough to negotiate the distance and to have this on the other side. So to completely break with what was stabilized, with what was expected. And actually it worked quite well because when you are on this side, you don't read the last space as a traditional space. You actually read it as a sequence of very, I don't like the word contemporary, but very fresh, very unexpected spaces. And when you go on the other side and you look back, it makes sense. So the, the room that is supposed to be classic actually fits very well the non-classical side of the project. And then these columns, they are the ones somehow breaking the two of them. They are the ones creating a before and after moment. And it's funny, like, even the step is somehow half living room, half dining room. And when you go back to the kitchen, the step is half kitchen, half dining, but the ceiling does the opposite. So you don't really know where one space starts and the other one ends. And that, that attracted us a lot here. And of course, you have the classical room if you look at it in a specific perspective. But I would prefer to look at it in a, in a sequence and not isolated. And then you have these funny photos where you feel like you wanted this to just continue or you wanted something random to happen, but the two of them actually operate quite well side by side. And then you have, you can take photos like this where it really feels, you know, Pinterest compatible. And you have this kind of, you know, Pinterest image, but then you have also the opposite. And except for the proportions of that window, this could have been designed in China, which for us, it's a crucial, crucial uh, necessity that the projects are not site specific. We have, we have a real problem with projects that only fit one specific space, that only fit one specific site, but I'm gonna talk about it in, in another project. And again, Pinterest. Um, and then when you look at the space, you see how the perimeter of the building relates to these exceptional rooms, but this is the project. You know, the project we did here was necessary, was crucial for the building to, to operate as a building. But the architecture that we wanted to discuss is just this, is the relation between a very classical room and these three spaces being just one. And then, about two years later, uh, we were asked to transform one of the most banal houses in Porto. I mean, this is in Fontaines. It's a very nice neighborhood, a neighborhood with a very strong identity. The people that live there really have a, a passion for the site. And, and the construction is defined by, whoa, uh, the construction is defined by the local technology. Most of these houses in Porto are defined by a granite perimeter wall that is then filled with a structure out of wood beams. And the dimension of the houses is very much the same all the time because of the length you could get the wood beams. So since the biggest beams you could get are between five to seven meters, depending on the case, the buildings, they are always inside this size. And in this case, it was actually a very short one because we have only 4.8 meters. It's very, very narrow. Um, and I'm gonna go back to this later. On the inside, it's, it's terrible. It, I mean, it was terrible. It was in a very nasty condition. It has been abandoned for almost 30 years. There were uh, leaks on the ceiling. I mean, everything was, was crumbling apart. And the plan, the plan was just terrible. You could, fit that, you could feel that there were several interventions in the past, but there's no spatial hierarchy. There's no structure. There's no nothing. And you can see the thick granite wall I was talking about. And then here, you know, you have the wood beams holding the floors. So we proposed the clients, ah, the clients are a young couple, they are not investors, they will live here, which for us it's so, so rewarding to design spaces for people to live in and not for Airbnb tourists. And we proposed them uh, a kind of overlaid system. So on the ground floor, you have an entrance that can lead you directly upstairs or you can go to the living room that by using a fluid geometry makes this room a kind of continuous space. So, and then it relates to the garden and it goes endlessly until the horizon. But on the top floor, you have a very complex set of geometries that makes all the rooms work in pairs. 
So like the relation between this room and the window is the absolute opposite of this one and the window. These two bathrooms are exactly the same, but the way how you display the bathrooms, uh, the fittings, and the way how you use them radically changes. The relation between a concave and a convex curve, I don't need to explain. And somehow on the ground floor, there's a big openness to the outside, and on the second floor, it's a very controlled and defined framed one. So we had to demolish everything because everything was in terrible condition. You can see the beams I was talking about. All of this was removed. And this is more or less from the same perspective, what you feel on the ground floor. You just, you don't have any limits, you don't have any references. The space works as one. And when you go on the other side, this is exactly the same thing you feel towards that very small window facing the street. So the whole ground floor, all the public spaces, living, dining, cooking, they are all facing the garden. And when you go upstairs, the kind of geometrical composition you have is much more complex. First you have a curve, you have the sloped ceiling, you have the rhythm defined by the wood beams. And then you have a very well staged window. One could say that if this one is really trying to look outside, this one is trying not to be seen from the outside. Although it's not a problem in this location, there are no neighbors nearby, but still. And when you see, when you see the two sides, you understand that the kind of geometrical composition, the kind of mental construction that was used to build the second floor is so different from the one below. But then it's misleading because we, you know, we really love Venturi and you know, this idea that he used the exact same finishes provides a sense of continuity. This is always the same house, but at the same time, spatially speaking, it's randomly different. You know, it's so, so opposite. And the back facade, you know, it's not that appealing at all. So the back facade was also completely replaced and even the facade is didactically explaining what happened. So you understand that there's a kind of relation where the interior walls actually continue and they go all the way until the end of the garden. And on the second floor, there's a perpendicular wall that creates a set, that creates a, a kind of frame to the view. So you can understand that the kind of living experience, the kind of architectural intention on the ground floor is radically different from the one you have on the second floor. So these are some photos of the construction. Uh, and I, I really like this image because I'm on the second floor before they mark the brick walls. And you see how this grid will somehow relate to the, the walls that will be used, so th that will be built. So all of, the, all of the structure of the second floor comes from a grid that actually comes from the most rational structure we could build, because again, we have a very low budget. And all of this defines the logic that on the ground floor, because we have a concrete slab, doesn't really make any sense. We don't need to worry about the structure in that case, so we can do whatever we want below. And this is how it looks like today. And this is, I hope, how it's gonna look like in a few in a few months. And because we have this situation between inside and outside, of course we have a window, we're gonna have probably curtains or whatever, but having this element here allows us to create a separation that is physical, that, you know, a little bit like the columns in the previous project, that clearly defines one side and another side, a before and an after. I don't think the glass is strong enough to do that, even if physically, of course, does it. And again, you see how these overlaid systems are so important for us, how these four rooms and these three spaces are somehow combined, and this, this space is the transition between two, it's A and it's B. And on that side, how one year later, we are trying to make these ideas even more radical, and we separate what is B from what is A. So they are clearly far away from each other. And here you can see how the grid of the roof defines the geometry that lies below, and on this case, this kind of complexity that was, I mean, it was not the first time we did this, it was much more discontrolled, um, resulted in something that tends to be, to have something similar. And ironically, as I said, we reached a lot of conclusions that we never noticed. These structural columns were there, we could not remove them. But this one, we could hide it. We could have found a different solution for it. We could even have some stress on the structure so that we don't need it but we kept it. And when we did the study that resulted in the book, we actually noticed that the projects that relate in this sense both had this uh, structural elements exposed. Serendipity. So, serendipity is the art or the casualty of finding what you are not looking for. And sometimes, 
in architecture, I mean, in architecture that happens quite, quite often. This was an apartment, again, early 20th century, late 19th century, we could not precise. That was, this is very typical in Lisbon. You, the, the structure is a little bit different from the one in Porto, but it's composed of several rooms, most of them very narrow, very small. They don't fit contemporary standards. They are not that comfortable. You even have long corridors and rooms without windows. The bathroom was outside. I mean, it was not, it was not a nice plan and it was not working according to what we uh, wanted to take away from it. And the client asked us to do a type two apartment, so to keep the typology, you see this is the original, these were the bedrooms, kitchen, bathroom. And it was very easy for us to find the main idea. The main idea was, you know, beautiful view over the river, the Tagus in the south, and a nice patio that we could reclaim in the back. So we wanted to connect both, and you can see that the same architectural idea could lead to several different plans. The one that stayed in the end was the last one. And what we decided to do was with a single line, connect both facades and connect them in a key point, the corner of the window, and to somehow define what is public on one side of the curve and what is private on the other side, and to create five equally distance and equally sized doors that would hide the programs. You know, like there's TV shows where you have five doors, you need to pick one and you don't really know what is behind. That was somehow the concept. And then on this side, there is a cold pavement marble that is not that expensive in Portugal, and plywood elements uh, on the bedrooms. So this was the feeling. And the living room was very long, very, you know, very elastic, very, very tense, because as you can see, there are not two perpendicular walls here. Everything is somehow you know, resulting from the geometry of the building and the intersection with this curve. So doing these collages, we were very free to, to play with them, to, to distort them. And then on the opposite side, uh, you see the space getting bigger and you have two windows at the end. We added a, a, a piece of mirror just to emphasize a little bit the width in the center. But all the pieces of furniture are freestanding. They don't really need to be, they have this, the same reading as the garage house. But what really imported, uh, what really mattered for us was how this elevation was going to define the whole living of the space. And the space is now built and it was, it's, it's, it's probably the most comfortable space we designed so far. I mean, I, I, we visited them a few months later and we see how they are occupied. And it's actually the one I could imagine myself living in. But it's a, it's a, very, it's a very tense space because at this point here, in the middle, you have about 2.2 meters, which is very, very narrow. Then it grows to almost 3 meters on one side, but it ends with 1.4 on the other one. So it's very, very narrow. But at the same time, it feels very generous and very big because of the light, the reflection of the materials. Even the paint is a very reflective paint. Even the lamp is a reflective lamp. And the painting on the doors was very carefully thought through so that they would appear luxurious. Because again, we were working with 400 euros a square meter. And if you want to have marble with this budget, you need to sacrifice everything else. But I think that in the end, it resulted quite well and the client commissioned us to design all the furniture. So everything that we have on the house, except the fridge, was designed by us. So even the hood, we, ha we have this thing with hoods with weird forms. Uh, but the kitchen is a kitchen, but it doesn't feel like a kitchen. Uh, although it's completely naked, you don't really read it as such. Um, and inside the bedrooms are very small, so they are very calm and you have the possibility of sleeping on the floor, but the, the wood pavement creates a, a big distinction with the one we have on the, on the living room. And again, we, designing furniture is not really our thing, but we, we actually enjoyed it quite a lot to work with these very, very narrow metal profiles and these very, very heavy pieces of stone. And all the stones are different. These are my t-shirts. And, and then you have the bathrooms that you know, are a kind of negative, so they have stone again, but very, very dark one to contrast with the white pieces. Um, and then finally the, pa the patio. This is where the bathroom was in the beginning, so we managed to get rid of everything, solve the drainage from the floors above, and just reclaim a space that was completely lost. And it's very, it's a strange space because you have buildings all around, so you only get light from one side a few hours a day, but it's quite, quite cute, which reminds us again of the original intention. But this is, this is the space I wanted to talk about. So this very narrow uh, space connecting two sides with a strong inner elevation, a very rigid elevation. This was designed before we actually designed any facade for a building. So we were designing inner elevations as if they were the facades of buildings themselves. 
And this led us uh, one year later to a house we just finished now. I don't have finished photos, but I have a few that could explain. In probably one of the nastiest neighborhoods in Porto. Uh, it's in a very complex area where before there was a social neighborhood that was demolished recently and where the properties, they cost nothing. So the client approached us and she said, I bought a house for 40,000 euros that is 120 square meters, I think, and that has one hectare of land. So if you understand this, she bought it for free. Uh, and I want you to refurbish. We said, yes, of course. Then she said what it was and it, everything made sense. But then she gave us complete freedom to go there, to study the building, to understand how, you know, it's not, a masterpiece of architecture, as you can see, how we could operate inside a very low budget and produce something outstanding. At the same time, she told us, I love that apartment you did with the blue doors. I really liked it, so I want that one. Which, which is something that tends to happen more often than we would like to clients showing up and you know, buying this and saying, I want a garage house. Well, it doesn't fit. It doesn't, it's not the same thing. But in this case, uh, she was very insisting. You know, she was very insistent on that, on that idea. I mean, you see, the interior was extremely nasty. This house had been abandoned for decades also. And in the back, well, there was no hope. But from, you see, this is Ahmed in desperation, just thinking, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do with this? Um, I mean, but because this is not a masterpiece, it doesn't mean that we cannot dream high. It doesn't mean that we cannot look at masterpieces to absorb the motivation to do one. We failed, it's not a masterpiece, but it's definitely better than it was before. It's, it's loved, the client is extremely happy, and it all started with a discussion around this building and around the strength that this roof has in the tension of its facade in the bottom of the roof. Of course, Leverance was probably not fighting with the economical constraints we were. The whole house had to be built with about 400 euros a square meter, so again, a very, very, very low budget. And we were trying to understand how maybe the richness, the, 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 the house itself is not depending so much on the architecture, it's depending on the occupation. So we could define a kind of calm, absolute space in relation to the garden, because I mean, one hectare, it's a lot of land, so you need to do something about it, and expect that the occupation is gonna, is gonna do it, is gonna make it an outstanding house. So since the beginning, there was a long talk, long talks with a client, so she, it's like she was part of the process, uh, as you can imagine, she's not an, a well-educated architect, so she's not able to discuss architecture as we do. But she's, she's a person, she's gonna live there. She has her own ambitions and intentions, and it was very interesting, you know, after so many renovations, to have a client also, you know, designing with us uh, a space. She was annoying sometimes, but that comes with it. And as you see, these three walls remain, everything else disappeared. On the first day, this sketch was designed by Julia on, I don't know, on the second day we started working on it. And it was clear that the client wanted a, a one bedroom house. So she lives alone with her husband, so she doesn't need any more. So because of the garden being on this side, we wanted to face the house to the garden and every program would be somehow stuck behind. And we, try, we tried a lot of options and at some point we ended up there. Of course, we tried to bring the same curve from Lisbon, she insisted. I mean, at some point we were wondering about a few, a small, a kind of different strategy, but it's true that it made sense, and it's not just because she insisted, it actually resulted on a, on a very clear spatial structure. But in op opposite to the project I showed before, in this case, the curve is not concave, it's convex. And you have the four openings that lead you to the four programs, reception, bedroom. This is a kind of attic above the closet and bathroom that can connect both. And the other space was a space that worked like this. You would cross. But this is a space that because you enter on this point and it faces the, the it's monodirectional, let's say, it creates a much more calmer center space. And we added this element that we are already bringing and recurring from other projects as a kind of space divider between what is the reception of the house and you can access all the programs and what is the living area. And this was the collage, how we could somehow have the column separating what are, you know, it's like if the column is defining a circulation space and the living area. And how on the other side of the column you have the relation with the garden. So the column is somehow the less important 
piece of architecture, but at the same time, the most relevant one. And it's not structural. We don't need this column. You will also see, you will actually see the photos without the column and everything's already in place. But it's, it's a very, it was a necessary element to finish the project. So this is the collage. The facade and 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 during this street, th there are a lot of very clumsy and terrible buildings. So we felt the need to increase a little bit the wall and to you know make a few twerks. Like our roof grows on top of the neighbor. This wall grows behind the, the roof. Then the gate is a little bit smaller than the neighbor wall. I mean, all of these mistakes were not really mistakes. They were carefully calculated so that in the end, well the house makes sense in that context, but makes sense in a clumsy way, in a clumsy, calculated clumsy way. So this was the beginning, we had to remove everything. You can see just the pre-walls that remain, the pieces of wall that we had to rebuild, the new roof structure. This is the thinnest roof you can build. It's up to 2.5 centimeters because all the insulation is on the inside and it gives a very light profile, a very thin profile, so it feels almost like the house is going to fly at some point. And, I mean, this is still in the process. Then we built a gigantic wall with plaster, etc., etc. And this is the space uh, one week ago. And you see that because of this idea from the occupation defining the use, we convinced the client to actually make the whole space white and to invest on a very cheap pavement that would somehow increase even more the ceiling height. But these doors are almost three meters high. So here in the middle, you have almost eight meters of ceiling height that was caused by the existing structure. And it's very nice to see how this curve somehow guides you. And you completely lose the, the sense of scale of this living room. This living room is gigantic, but you don't really perceive its size. These windows are very tall, but you don't, you don't, you don't feel that. It's a piece of architecture where scale and spatial referentials, they, they just disappear and you don't really understand what you're looking at. And again, this relation, if we had the column here, it would make more sense, but you know, this is, this is what you're gonna feel, like the relation with the garden. And on the outside, this is how the house looks like today. It's very clumsy, you see, like our property ends here, but the roof grows a little bit on the neighbor. It's, uh, it's quite, quite funny. And we managed to gain some budget to do a very nice detail on the top. This is just Photoshop, but the final one is gonna look good. And this is, th these are the two spaces that somehow this house is the direct result from this one and the study we did in it, but it's actually completely different. So the, the one might say that you know, they look alike, but the fact that they look alike does not really mean that they have the same spatial experience. And the mental construction behind this space is so radically different from that one. But as I said, serendipity, once in a time, once in a while, you just find something that you were not looking for. And the column helps to somehow break the relation with the previous project. I don't, I don't consider that it's correct to do projects for a certain client different because you did something else before for another client. But that's what I was talking about. We now have an agenda and the projects are not just for that client, they're also for ourselves. And we are reading them as a group of projects and not just as individual islands. And you see how the relation between the doors and the space is different and how without this column, you get to a dead end. And in this case, there's always this flux. We have very repetitive programs. We are, I would say 60% of the time asked to do the same thing. And we always try not to do the same thing. And this is a series of free projects that I'm gonna go through very fast, where we find these buildings in Porto that most of them are abandoned for decades. They are decaying. You will probably read online many texts that you know the city center is being destroyed by tourists. Well, it's true, but this building was destroyed 50 years ago and no one cared. So it's, it's quite misleading what is happening in Porto. Uh, but uh, we find the buildings like this. They usually have this, uh, Facade, again, you see the size is defined by the size of the tree trunks, etc. And there's always this granite element. Granite is the stone of the city that uh, defines the doors, the windows, uh, the structure. And this was the first time we had a chance to design a facade. Uh, we tried with the municipality many, we had many meetings to try to understand what we could actually do. But in the end, there's no way we can demolish this building. We could just change the tiles. Uh, and that's what we did, we changed the tiles and the doors. And we worked with a local artist, uh, I mean she's Polish but she's based in Portugal, 
and we tried to understand how the original tile looked like and what we didn't want to do. And we tried to, while discussing with her, understand what she wanted to do, what was our agenda, the kind of things we want to explore. And this is a kind of timeline of the tiles. In the end, we decided to use three tiles that you find very often in the city, this one, this one, and this one, and create derivations of it, and to create a system of how to paint them and how to produce them. We produced a huge amount of them. Then we started playing with them. It was a very, how to say, uh, handcraft uh, task. We had a lot of fun doing it. And in the end, we created this kind of constellation that, well, the photo is better than this, that resulted on the, on, the, on the facade that we see here. And it's very nice to see how it somehow relates to what we have in the city because all of these fragments exist there, but at the same time, it's almost offensively not local, uh, which, is, which is a nice limbo. And I really like the relation between the very strong color of the door. You see there are two doors. This one is the public door of the building. You can count the mailboxes. This one is for a private property. So the red door has this symbolism of the main door and the blue one is just related with the project. Um, and I, I really like the tension between this rigidity and this austerity almost and the playfulness almost, the childish playfulness of the tiles. And you can see how they were all painted following their geometry. This was the plan, again, very fragmented, and I'm going to move forward. In the end, this was what we could build, or what we were asked to build, the maximum amount of apartments. You always have the same limitation because you need to put all the bathrooms and staircase in the center so that you liberate the facade for the living spaces. And in this case, because they were all somehow uh, you know, it, the project allowed us to, and it was the first project we were doing in this direction. Uh, we created this kind of technical machine in the center where you can have all the storage, kitchen, and bathrooms. And then we gave them a strong color because, I mean, this is short-term rental, so no one is going to live there too long because otherwise these colors were very offensive. But for a short term, it has a strong identity. And the pieces of furniture that we designed one year before are now starting to appear in other projects. It's and then these small elements that reflect the shapes of the tiles on the facade are always in front of the, of the kitchen so that you can first distinguish the apartments and second not destroy the wood on the floor. And then these elements somehow, you know, it's, it's not amazing architecture. It's just what it had to be. It was our first project in this direction. And you can ask the photographer to do kind of nice photos, but in the end it's it's a commercial project, it's a retail project, it's a project that is supposed to you know, be Airbnb compatible, which didn't attract us that much, although the bathroom this was probably my favorite space, this kind of capsule of tiles um, resulted quite well. And then there are these weird moments where you have several apartments you can access to, and then some of the apartments reflect the shape of the roof or the shape of the stair, but the, the idea is the same. And then there's a garden. And then, once we are finishing this, there's a second one. And the second one, guess what? The same facade, the same everything. Guess the program, maximum number of apartments. Guess the plan, staircase in the center and apartments in the right and left. And we sketch a lot also. We tried to find, I mean, we were so frustrated because we understood that we were going to get a lot of this and we didn't want to do the same thing over and over again. So if the first one was somehow technocratic, it had this machine-like look where you can just do, it's, it's very practical, you know? It's, you have storage space, kitchen, bathroom. In this one, we went in the opposite direction. We went as formal as we could because we, this project was a direct re reaction to the first one. Again, doing a project in relation to another one, although we were not thinking about it at the time. So we made several tests. This, this coincided with the moment we were studying the early Toyoito, so this morpheme started to appear. The, the sketches on top of, of the renders and then the final collages that somehow were expressing a certain kind of geometry mixed with the stair shape from Japan 1970s. And then on the second floor, you don't have the wall, but you have the ceiling doing the same thing and the shape of the stair is inverted. And the kitchen somehow becomes a kind of art piece that is standing in the middle of the living space. The colors of the doors are, I mean, the, even the pattern on the floor, I mean, everything was a reaction to what we did before. It's almost like we needed to do this. We needed to just neglect our first project because we were so unhappy about it. 
And this was the result. And the spatial structure we built is, as you can see, is very different from the other one. The other one was somehow rational. It was about the blue wall that defines all the programs, and this is much more formal. You see, below you have the shape on in plan, above you have the shapes, and the curves, and the waves in section. And the front facade, again, the same thing. I mean, the maximum we managed to do was to convince the municipality to balance the composition because we only had one door on this side and we couldn't have a door on this side because of the metro thing, so somehow the composition is balanced, and that was it. And it's very nice, you know, Tavro used to say that you should, Tavro was the master of Caesar, and he used to say that you should not mix marble with granite. But I mean, it's so nice to see the two of them coming together once in a while. It's not easy, but it's, it's, it's very nice to see the roughness of the granite and the kind of posh attitude of the marble next to it. But again, this is a refurbishment, but everything is built from scratch. So in the end, it's more or less finished. We are just, we are gonna photograph it soon. But these geometries, they came alive as we expected. And on the back facade, uh, we have a garden that somehow follows the same kind of geometries. Everything comes together as one, contrary to the first one where that tile facade makes no sense with interior, it just happened. And we had the chance for the first time, this was the first project in which we were gonna design a facade because on the back of this building, we were able to demolish everything. We were able to build something new. We were not just changing the fitting between the granite. We could do something ours. And what we were doing was, we were looking at Peter Markley, at Oresotsas, we were looking at Rossi, we were looking at Alberti. I mean, we were, we were looking at the masters of the masters and we were trying to understand what are we gonna do? This is our first built facade. It's gonna be built, it's gonna exist. It's not just a proposal, it's gonna exist. And we, of course, as you saw, the narrative of the whole project is a little bit about losing control. So we lost control and we moved from very strange and kind of pseudo-rational compositions towards crazy patterns. We wanted to do something that was never tried before. And when you have this starting point, I mean, this is probably the worst facade ever. Uh, anything you do is gonna look better. That was granted as a start. But we wanted to do something that was not only better, we wanted to do something that was game-changing for us. We wanted to do something that would define the level from, from now on, we only do above this, we don't do anything below. And the facade is now built. It's quite, it was quite an, an effort, but in this case we had a little bit of budget, not too much, but enough at least to, to do it. And it's fantastic because now we managed to do something that I think it's what the municipality wants, because we cannot touch the front facades. The facade that is facing a small private garden is the main facade. So the whole project was designed as if this is what defines the main facade. So we have a street side, that's true, but this is the front. This is the front. The street side is the back facade. This is the front. And it was the first time we designed a marble door, which is something I don't believe happened many times in history, but we managed to do one in a kind of low-cost project. And this is what I was talking about. Although this one is facing a street, this is the main facade. And I don't care that only three or four people can see it. The structure of the architecture defines so. And then for project, again, imagine. Building like this, you can only change the tiles. Uh, in the inner structure, we have bathrooms and staircase in the center. But in this case, this project was a reaction to the previous two. If the first one was trying to be technocratic and the second one was trying to be formal, the third one wanted to be somehow absolute. We wanted to finish this chapter. So we, between, among us in the office, we decided this is the last time we do a building like this. We don't do more of these projects because otherwise we're gonna be labeled as, you know, those Airbnb guys, we don't want that. But we need to do a last one that somehow defines an ending to this process. If the first one was practical, the second one was almost stupid, this one has, to be absolute. So we introduced an architectural element, because if you take these columns away, you have exactly the same as you had before. You could change the form, but it was exactly the same thing. With these columns, we introduced an element that defines a hierarchy. So you have a cooking, living, dining, sleeping area, and there's a before and after, and by using the different directions of the wood on the floor, you can somehow emphasize it even more. And clearly there's a before and after in your relation with the columns. So it's not, you know, in the other ones, we don't even know where to put the bed. You can put it anywhere. In this one, if you put the bed in one specific space, you will somehow define everything after it. And 
it's already in place. These photos are not updated, but it's very nice. We already have the brick all the way up and the contractor is very confused because he doesn't really know why we have a column that, because it's not structural, it doesn't touch the ceiling. So why do we have it there? Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it, you can feel, and, and I mean, this, these apartments, they are 4.6 meters high, they are gigantic, but there's no mezzanine, no anything. It's just about the pure space with this central element. It's quite, quite something to see it there. And on the back facade, again, there's a correction. In this case, we had to be contextual. We have a terrible neighbor on the right, and we had to somehow find a way that this wouldn't happen. We don't want to see what is happening there. So we just found a, a way to transit between the scale of this alien and you know, the normal scale of these buildings. We demolished the annex, we opened the window, and this should be the final facade. And in this case, why going back to white? This was actually the project with the biggest budget so far, because this was supposed to be absolute. It's not about the fancy label on design, about, oh, Falada's a marble facade. No, no, this one is about the space. We don't even care if this project is not published. For us, in our narrative, it's crucial that this one finishes a certain period, that finishes a certain sequence. And making a white facade makes perfect sense as a conclusion. Like, you did all of those crazy, stupid projects, and then, then you just accepted that this is this is enough. And you can see the three of them side by side. You see, there's this axis of staircases and bathrooms. There's always the facade facing. I mean, there's not that much to invent. But when you look at it, you have clearly, you know, what I would call a young architect's project, the pseudo-technical, super functional, funky project. Then you have the, real, the, the complete reaction to it, the, the architect lost his mind project. And then you have the one that tries to finish a chapter, and the three of them are exactly the same, one might say, but program-wise. But in reality, they, they, they differ so much that uh, I think it only makes sense to show them if we show the three of them. If we show one of them isolated, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And you see how this relates, you know, what, what remains from one side to the other, what, what keeps happening and what disappears. Even the way how the wood is displayed is changing and it's trying to become more and more absolute. The facades that, you know, pretty much stay the same and then the, the facades that completely change. Um, final topic. And it's a good one. Um, Pornography versus irritism. Um, as I said in the beginning, we are moving towards new construction more and more and more. Uh, I'm not going to show a lot of new buildings tonight because most of them were commissioned in the last year. So they are either in project, permit or starting construction now. So I'm going to focus on only two of them. Uh, our first house, except the bird house. I mean, our first real house for real people that is nearly finished and uh, our second house, and the, the conflict that exists between the two, of two, the two of them. This is a photo from the Kamiwada house from Toyoito, which is probably one of the ugliest houses in history from the outside, the less spectacular you can imagine, but that on the inside has both the best rhetorics you could have, but at the same time, a beautiful, beautiful spatial composition that results in these outstanding spaces. So you have the most banal programs in the corners relating to the most banal facade. And then inside, the circulation, tea room, ceremony room, dining room, take this weird form that there's no justification for and create the most outstanding space of the ugliest house ever built. And we are truly fascinated by this period from Toyovito, his early years, that coincided with the second style from Shinohara, where Shinohara was designing houses that were composed of one main space, what he called the symbolic space, surrounded by the served spaces, let's say bedrooms, bathrooms, living rooms. This was not a living room, this was just a hall. You know, it's not even the living room, it's just a main space, a kind of heart for the house. And this research led us to our Chicago Biennial project where we studied nine of these houses and we tried to understand how, how of them were actually the same house somehow. They, they belonged to four different architects, they were built separately, they were not collaborating in any of them, but at the same time they make so much sense together. And it's one of the richest and most interesting moments in domestic architecture in history, the five years between 69 and 74 in Japan. 
um, which is ironic if you consider that uh, Expo Zac uh, and the uh, climax of the metabolism was happening in 70, but still. And these are the, these are the spaces we extracted from them. And these are the models, as I showed before. And when we were faced about three years ago with our first house, uh, you see all the houses, this is our plot, all the houses are kind of the same. This is a, a kind of nasty neighborhood in Marco. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a city in the suburbs from Porto. And, and this is on the server of the server of the server. And we decided to do a house that was aiming at being somehow absolute. So we didn't want to relate to any of the houses around the, the plot, so we made it completely north-south. We found a shape that was not the same. We, they, they had two levels, we decided to do only one. We tried to, in every single decision, not relate to the context in which we were, because the context was not appealing at all. And Ahmed says that this is the most contextual thing we could do. We were actually caring too much about it. But this was the final, the final footprint. And inside, the clients only requested for three bedrooms. One bedroom for the clients, a couple, one bedroom for the daughter, and one bedroom for the grandparents that would live with them. So we gave a fancy title of the house for three generations. And we just went quite logistical on it. We took the, the rules, the book of uh, laws, and we understood the minimum bedroom, how could we increase it, and how could we after intersect it in some way that would define a different spatial condition for the three of them. And if the square defines the family, the cell of the family, each of these shapes defines the personality of each generation. We didn't actually tell each generation where they were going to live. We just did a model, we opened the model, and we let them fight for it. And they understood the idea quite well, because in a few seconds, the daughter took this one, the grandparents this one, and the parents that one. And we didn't, I mean, we were kind of expecting that, but we never planned it. And it was very nice to see it happening. And what is really, really important and relating to the research about the Japanese houses was the negative space. So the square was defined a priori. The three bedrooms were defined isolated from the project. And when put together, the more expressive each one of these shapes would be, the more expressive the personality of one of the generations would be, the more outstanding, the more unique the space they share would be. So the space that is in the center is a direct reflection from the personality of the family that occupies the house. And this was a very fucked up and complex spatial construction when we were discussing it in the office because we wanted to make sense of it. We wanted to explain it to the clients, but it, it was very, very hard because they couldn't care any less. I mean, they, they just wanted the budget and the costs and construction. I mean, but we managed to convince them. And this was the first time ever that we built a central column because this is the main access, and this is the living area, and this is the cooking area. So there was a need to separate the two spaces. They really insisted on that idea. They wanted a kitchen and a diving room and a living room, and we didn't want to build a wall. It would just kill it all. So we tried to find the le less present architectural element that was the column in this case that would separate the two, and we thought that we made a discovery by doing, you know, this central element that somehow isolates the kitchen and it's not so common to find in our contemporary architecture, but it was coming from, from early Shinohara, it was coming from Sakamoto, it was actually coming from Izumo from 1,000 years ago. It was not really ours. The appropriation and the use we gave to it, it was ours, but the column has been there floating in the back of our minds for a long time. And this was, this was the proposal we showed them, that this is not just a technical device, this is actually the, the axis of rotation of the whole house. This is not something that shows up to solve a problem. It actually structures the way how you're gonna use it, how you're gonna use the living room. And the most important thing was that if this column is not structural, it will look like a mistake. The architects fucked up and they didn't put the column inside a wall. That's how it feels. So in order to make it completely clear, the, the column finishes 20 centimeters before the ceiling. Because this way, clearly the architect didn't fuck up. There's a reason for that column to be there. That column is an architectural device. That column is there to structure a space. It's not there to structure the concrete. Actually, the structure of the concrete is actually here. And we will see it now. And you see, inside there are these kind of micro universes of each generation because they told us what they wanted to have there. But outside, there's not any limit on the space. It's the space they share, and only the column negotiates the relations they have there. So this is, this is it. 
And the house does something that I think it's very polite. All the houses are somehow looking on the side to the street. This is the only house that welcomes people in the village. It's the only house that looks in the eyes of the visitors and it's proud enough to say, I'm special, I'm not one of the pack. And the system of the facade reflects the system of the plan. And this is what I was talking about. This is the shoe of the concrete column that holds the roof. This is the concrete column that no one will ever see, that will be plastered inside a wall. This is the shoe of the column that doesn't matter. It matters for the engineer, but not for us. This is the shoe of the column that matters. Almost irrelevant, almost invisible. We even need to dash it because it's only gonna be cast in the end. You see that this column is holding everything. This column here will hold the architecture. If you take this column away, the ceiling might fall, but the architecture doesn't. If you take this column away, the house loses a lot more than a ceiling. And so it should be finished until Christmas. Uh, and this one is the one we're gonna start construction now. It's the house under a big roof, which is a title of a house from Shinohara that inspired us quite a lot for this one. And in this one, the clients asked us for a house that looks like a house. A house that looks like a house. We tried to deconstruct what they were meaning and trying to mean, and, and, and we understood that they had a, a kind of understanding of the traditional Portuguese house in their minds that was not at all incompatible with modern architecture, with contemporary architecture, but needed to have certain elements, a chimney, windows on white walls, uh, orange tiled roofs. And so we went to the masters of this kind of houses and we tried to talk to them, not by bringing Shinohara, not by bringing Toyoito, but by bringing Tavora, by bringing Siza. And we understood that this was exactly what they were talking about. They didn't know any of these houses. They actually thought these were new houses, which is fantastic because these are from the 50s, 60s, 70s. And it was interesting that we were showing them something so old, but at the same time that for them was so fresh. And it gave us the opportunity to design a house that, according to their words, looks like a house. Um, at the same time, we were trying to find other examples of other references of ours that did something similar. We were looking at Rodolfo Giatti, which is also it's a very intriguing architect. I, I, I still don't fully understand him, but it's, it's, it's way more interesting than the sun. And there's Leverance again with this monumental attitude of the flower kiosk or leverance in the temporary pavilions. There's, there was this idea that the clients wanted so much the living room to be a continuous space. They, they, they said they hated the Marco house. They didn't want that. That's not what they wanted. They wanted a house that, not, not the house per se, but the spatial structure. They understood it. We explained it to them. These are teachers. These are people with whom you can discuss architecture. And they understood it, but they didn't want it. They wanted something else. They wanted a clear separation between what is the living area and what are the served secondary spaces. At the same time, they didn't want something linear. They didn't want something easy. So Rodolfo Giatti again gave us several clues when you look at these houses and all the spaces are somehow intricated and connected to each other and the relation and a reaction to the previous and the previous and the previous. And this is the site uh, in Famalicão. It's uh, again a city, the suburbs from Porto. It's actually very close to a beautiful house from, from Siza. And the relation of the site with the street is this, there's none, so the site is higher and it just ends like this, like if a knife cut at the site. This is the program, which is exactly the same program of the Marco house, except there's a garage. And we, want, we wanted to neglect, or we wanted to, I mean, we are very proud of our first house, but we wanted to do something else. We wanted to run away from that house. We wanted to find a house that was so different as possible from the previous. We, do, we didn't want to start a production line of similar houses. And we tried so many diagrams. I mean, these are very simple schemes on how to distribute the program. We tried so many elevations, trying to understand how this roof that they cared so much about could improve or, you know, define the identity of the house. We, at some point, reduced all the proposals to four archetypes and we tried to discuss with them how the roof is gonna relate to the living room that is gonna relate to the bedrooms. And in the end, as the progress kept moving forward and forward, we understand that this house was gonna be divided in two sides. A living side that is as blank as possible, like the Shinohara, the Toyoito living room, and the Rudolf Olgiati 
private spaces that are completely insane and intricated and depending on each other. And then at this stage, it became clear the kind of facade we're going to have. It needed to be absolute. We have two systems inside, but we need to bring them together under one big roof. And this is the final plan that has this very banal, one might say, living room. And then from this living room, you only access two spaces that lead you to all the secondary programs. And all the rooms are somehow kinked, are somehow broken, either to fit cabinetry or to adjust to a certain regulation or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not as complicated as the Rudolf Olgiati plan, but it's as complicated as they wanted it to be. We would go way further, but this was the negotiation we managed to, 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 to achieve. And the structure of the roof is very important. So it's not only important on the outside, it's important on the inside. It's exposed. It has a certain identity, a certain attitude. And color is, again, very important. We are trying still to understand, because it didn't move to construction yet, the, the exact color scheme we want to use, how the detail of the doors is going to relate to the detail of the roof. How I mean, all of these folders are 3D folders. Inside each of them, you have thousands, hundreds of images. It's, it's insane. We spend days and days and days just trying to find the right balance between all the elements. And once in a while, we give a few steps back and we try things that are not really ours and that we are not fully comfortable with, but just to be sure that that's not what we want. In order to find what we want, we first need to understand what we don't want. And many of these tests are just that. And then there's this discussion about the finishing of the ceiling, colors of the doors, etc., etc. It's very, it's very much, it's much more complex than the previous one. The previous one is about a white space. It's about its idea per se. This one has a, a relation to construction that we never explored in any of the projects we did so far. And the way how we look at the living room in different means, in different drawings, with different thicknesses, without the thicknesses of the wall, with the thicknesses of the wall, as an early collage, as a kind of empty space. I mean, then we do these ones, we do hundreds of them, corrections on top of corrections on top of corrections, that result on a final collage of the space that somehow we were trying to run away so hard from the previous house that had this column negotiating the spatial relation that in the end we ended up doing a house where the dining table is going to do exactly the same. Depending on how you navigate through the space, it doesn't matter. The dining table is the epicenter that negotiates the relations between the husband, that in this family is the husband that cooks, and the daughter and the wife. I mean, it's, it's quite, quite a... It's quite something to, to run away so hard from something and end up finding it in the end. And then the structure of the facade follows a very clear front facade, back facade system, but the back facade is actually the one with the important roof. And the two side facades try to somehow mimic each other. And what is funny is that the chimney that we were trying to avoid so much uh, that came from Tavor and from so many places, in the end, defines the front facade facing the street, relates to the main door. I mean, it's then there is this weird concrete element that somehow puts an end to the ceiling, to the roof, because otherwise the roof would just continue endlessly, conceptually speaking. And then there's the random window that brings an oculus on the zenithal light on the kitchen. It's it's a it's a house with two faces, where one is I would say quite ours, and the other one is quite from the client, but it's a house that fits so well its context. We are very, very happy with the, with the final result. And when we put the two of them side by side, this house is completely pornographic. The relation that you have between the private spaces and this one is so intimate, it's so not negotiable. It is what it is. Everyone is bare naked in their spatial experience. And that one is exactly the opposite. There's a very clear separation between the two. There are even these negotiation spaces that are circulation areas where people can gather and then go to the bathroom or the bedroom. So it's funny that we, although the image somehow relates, the two structures manage to do exactly what we wanted to achieve. And again, how we try to run away, I mean, material-wise they are different, but the column and the table do the same thing in different ways. And how we ran away from the image of this house, but the most important aspect here is the chimney. The chimney. This one ends with a concrete beam, concrete beam. In the end, they are very different, but they both have the square windows, the round, round window here and there. I mean, it's, you can run away, but it always catches up, you know. And finally, to end, 
uh, arbitrary choice. Uh, after so many houses, why not showing something else? We were invited to, in the middle of this study, to produce our first public commission, a small temporary gallery to put in the gardens of Schalves. And while we are doing this study, the study about our own work, a work that is fueled by private commissions, refurbishment, housing mostly, we are faced with the challenge of designing a small temporary gallery with no limitations. We had a budget that was not a bad budget, but we could do whatever. We, they actually ask the, the, pavil the, the architects doing these pavilions to be as authentic as possible. But I mean, we never been this way. We did competitions for gigantic buildings. We did housing projects. And as such, the sketch became more and more natural. When you have no motivation, you sketch and you sketch and you sketch. And at some point, we were not really sketching details or we were not trying to find an idea. We were just going with the tide and we were designing this kind of folies, this kind of happy pavilions to put in a garden. And we actually designed six of them. Uh, and then in the end, we only built one, but our site was glorious. The first time we went there, because in the beginning, we didn't know where it was going to be, we fell in love. I mean, the, the landscape, the slope, the scale, I mean, you can, you can see, and the surroundings. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful space. And as such, since when you have no coordinates, we define our own square plan oriented north-south. From that decision, we define the plinth, uh, you know, in a very Miesian style. We raised the pavement a little bit so that we could deny the relation with the ground and define a solid and stable ground from where we could grow. We made the most efficient wood structure possible and then we tweaked it by adding elements that were not clearly necessary, that by duplicating some elements that no one really understood really why we were doing it. We started discussing materiality, the rule and the exception. We brought color. We brought, again, the, the circle that is showing up so many times, so many times in our project. We designed a plan uh, and inside we should have a video projection that's important. And we made it as big as we could. If we could make it bigger, we would have made it bigger inside that budget. We created a system for the facades, a system that, you know, as you keep moving and moving around the building, it's endless. Like, although this is facing the front, this is not the front facade. This is, you know, it's like it's cylindrical. You never know when it's going to end. And then we defined uh, two entrances so that people could access on, on one side, see the video, and then exit on the other. And then this was the final, the final result. We are so happy with it. It's, it's such a, I mean, it's a very small thing. It's a 40 square meters pavilion with a 20, 20,000 euros budget, I think. But it's, it's so different from everything we did so far. And it helped us to somehow explore and get rid of this trade jacket that is the private, uh, there are the private projects. And all these funny details, I mean, this is rough construction, this is rough wood, uh, started popping out. And then the elegance of the stone that gives the hint of luxury points out the entrance. And then there are these beams that are inverted that are hanging from the actual structure that make people think, why? Why is this happening? Then there's the blank facade. There's the facade with the secondary opening. The scale is impressive. When you are on site, it's much bigger than you actually expect. And then when you go inside, you have these chairs that are an installation from the artist and this element that because we need ventilation, you put the element there and that's where you put the thing to project the video. And the relation to the outside is also very, very, uh, very beautiful on both ends because you know the landscape was already fantastic. Anything we would do there would work with the landscape. And then there is the, the, the kind of local stone that gives it a, an anchor point in Porto. So we try to neglect the ground, we try to neglect everything, but in the end, we put a piece of granite as the first step to enter the building. It's like you run away, but it, you can't hide it. It catches you. And this is the photo more or less from the same location from the first day. And this is so much ours, although we don't really know why. I mean, it's, it's, it's Fala, without control, without limitations. If we would design a house without any constraints, something like this could happen. So this, were, this, was, this was everything I had to say, and I think I talked a lot more than I was supposed. Yes, a lot more. And I would like to end with Steven Spielberg. Um, there was a time where Steven Spielberg was amazing. There was a time where I was a kid and seeing a Steven Spielberg movie was fantastic. It didn't matter which movie, any of them was fine. But this one is by far my favorite. 
probably to, it's, it didn't age well, if you see it today. But at the time, the, the concept, you know, triggered me. I was five when I saw it in the cinema with my parents. And the concept is very simple. Robin Williams is Peter Pan. But Peter Pan grew up. He forgot that he was Peter Pan. He moved to London. He works in this uh, economical scenario where he has a company and he has employees and he has responsibilities and he forgets about Neverland. But one day he needs to go back. He needs to go back to Neverland and to rescue his son and daughter. And the whole film is not about this. It's about Peter Pan remembering why he is Peter Pan. It's about someone understanding why dreaming is more important sometimes than reality and why he couldn't fly because he didn't remember. But at some point, it clicks. And he remembers why he's Peter Pan and he's happy again. And everyone is happy. And there's a, a fantastic fight between him and Hook and you know, Dustin Hoffman. It's, it's fantastic, the movie, how it ends. And, but more important, the punchline that you know, at some point you should not lose track of where you are. And this is where we are right now. We are in this Peter Pan moment. We grew up, the office became a company. We increased the team, we are 10 right now. It's quite, quite a demanding amount of salaries to pay. The amount of work is more and more complex. I mean, new construction, a lot of regulations, municipalities, engineering projects. I mean, it's becoming sometimes almost frustrating to do architecture because of all of these problems. But once in a while, it's good to go back to 92 and to this good Steven Spielberg movie and to understand that we should never lose track of what actually made us who we are. And that's why we are absolutely convinced that Robin Williams was by far the best Peter Pan. So thank you so much.